as a professor here, do you like yes. uh, regularly publishes at uh, New Rips and ISML? How how would you see the future of journals uh, and uh, the conference? Yeah, yeah I think uh, it's getting too big and uh, not uh, really <laughs> rigorously reviewed. And uh, so I don't know. In the, <laughs> so for, I think it's more become like a popular place. People just uh, go there, present some things, I don't know how many, not many of them very deep. That's my view. <laughs> okay. yeah. I have a question for you actually. So yeah. for the, you used to be area editor for optimization at management science. So yes. how does the paper seeing that session uh, compare with the SAM optimization and the mass programming? So what's the difference? Yeah. yeah. I think uh, I I would say math uh, in management of science a little bit soft. That's my view. Yeah, <laughs> I think they more emphasize on uh, potential application, yes. practical impact, those kind of things. Yeah, I, yeah. So yeah. I think um, math programming or math of OR or probably Sam. Yeah, more rigorous. Than Sam. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I wish they can uh, publish more, but sometimes you, you need both. You yeah. need some paper, very popular topic and uh, may not be very deep, <laughs> but, but maybe create some kind of like a new wave of the research. Yeah. Other hand, you, you want more depth analysis so yeah i think that each one have a pros and cons so, yeah. i see yeah i have never submitted anything to management science or operations research yeah, but i see there are new session like data science in yeah research and uh, analytics also in management science so, so that's I, right yeah yeah but 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 they also need to be kind of uh, yeah, uh, behind, I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so it's uh, almost uh, three. So we can start in three minutes, program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Should, should I put my full screen or? Sure, 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 yeah. Okay.
Uh, Tora, we may start. Okay. Sure. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the online seminar on the mathematical foundations of data science. Uh, thank you all very much for joining. Uh, our seminar is generously sponsored by Two Sigma. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, I'm very honored to introduce our distinguished speaker today, Professor Yin Yu Ye from uh, Stanford University. Professor Ye is currently the uh, KT Lee Chair Professor of Engineering at Department of Management Science and, and Engineering and Institute of Computational and Mathematical Engineering of Stanford University. He is also the director of the MS and E Industrial Affiliation Program. He received his PhD degree in engineering economic systems and, operation, and operations research from Stanford University. Professor Ye has made fundamental contributions in optimization, operations, operations research, management science, and other related fields. His, his work has greatly influenced several generations of researchers. Uh, he has received many prestigious academic awards, such as uh, 2009 John, uh, John, no uh, John Neumann, uh, John von Neumann Theory Prize, 2015 SPS Signal Processing Magazine Best Paper Award, uh, 2014 Siam Optimization Prize, 2014 uh, IS ISMP Zen Lectureship Prize, and 2006 Farkas Prize on Optimization. He has supervised numerous doctoral students who have also become academic leaders. Uh, he has also published numerous articles in prestigious journals and his textbook Linear and nonlinear programming has been public has been popularly used in academic education as well. Uh, currently, his research interests include uh, continuous and discrete optimization, data science and, and application, algorithm design and, and analysis, a computational game, market equilibrium, a metric distance geometry, dynamic resource allocation, and stochastic and robust decision making, and etc. Today, Professor Ye will talk about distributionally robust optimization, online linear programming, and markets for public good allocations. Please join me in welcoming him. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. And also thank you for letting me to give a, a talk on this uh, very, very uh, prestigious platform. Uh, so uh, this is a, a great opportunity to share some of my researches okay uh, since this is for uh, internet and also for general audience so i'm going to talk about the three subjects in a little bit high levels not in much technical details okay uh, so this is uh, 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 three topics i'm going to talk about uh, first i'm going to introduce uh, what's the stochastic distribution in robust optimization? A little bit of review. Then I'm talking about the distribution in robust optimization under several kind of uh, scenarios. Okay. So since this uh, theories is a math uh, foundation for data science, so I basically uh, think about property probability theory is one of the pillars under for data science. So. I'm going to talk about what's the application and uh, use DRO. Okay. Then I'm going to talk about the online, uh, could be a binary, means the decision variable is a take zero or one for linear programming and also dynamic resource allocation. So in this topic, I basically going to talk about some optimization theory. Uh, that's what I think uh, is another pillar for the data science. Then third one, I'm going to talk about uh, the markets for efficient public goods allocation. So this one involves a little bit of economic theories, because in my view, uh, the decision making are not entirely driven by data, but also may be related to human behaviors or human natures. So I think economic theory is also can be very richly linked to data science. Overall, I basically want to develop a tractable and approvable models, algorithms for decision making and optimization with uncertain online and dynamic 
and the massive data. So this is uh, uh, what I have been working. So I'm going to walk through these three subjects. Okay, again, probably in a little bit of high level, not much details, but I do touch basis. What kind of uh, and the math foundation we have been used here. So first, I'm going to introduce what's the stochastic or distributional robustic optimization. Uh, we actually, in many, many cases, because the data is uncertain, so optimization is usually solve a so-called stochastic optimization. So we basically have our decision variables, like X, in certain some constraint set, we actually maximize our objective functions. This objective function decided by our decision X, but also decided by the nature, okay? Let's say psi, but psi is uncertain. So we usually do, if we know the distribution, then we minimize expected objective value for any, for any given X, okay? Of course, in data science, uh, usually decision variable would be the beta, okay? And, uh, and, the, and the, the maximize rather than, actually it's the minimize rather than maximize. But here I'm just use maximize, pretend we maximize some kind of a revenue, okay? So uh, X is the physical constraint set, psi represent some kind of a rundown variables. So this is stochastic optimization have some pros in many cases, and the expected value is a good measure of performance. And also in, we can simply apply like a simple sample average. We collect a sample at a different side. We just sum it up and maximize the average. Of it. But the cons, uh, we have to know explicitly the distribution of side. Of course, you can use the sample distribution, but the question is, the sample distribution really reflects the real distribution, okay? And also, if this distribution is wrong, then you have a, maybe have a garbage in, garbage out, and you maximize uh, wrong things. Even you know the distribution, the solution decision may still generally risky. So this is a probably a very, very classical channel. We have a picture, which is the panda, okay? So we put this picture to some kind of an AI identifier, they will tell this is a panda, okay? But however, if we add a little bit noise, okay, then result in a picture. Uh, then we put this same AI identifier, then they say, this is not panda, this is a gibbon, okay? So for many people don't know what is the gibbon? Gibbon actually is the monkey, right? So, uh, this is a famous example just to show if we just simply use a sample to training our AI identifier, you may very, very risky to some kind of data perturbations or some kind of attack or some of, you know, and, uh, and the small changes. So we, so that's why maybe our training data may not represent the true distribution what we want to uh, optimize. So this is a uh, 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 pictures. So in many, many, this problem has been studied in operation research, okay? So in the old days, people say, oh, we shouldn't just maximize expected value. We should maximize the worst case objective value. So basically in this case, we select the psi from this support set of psi, and we support the worst one, which is the smallest one. Then we maximize. Well, this is usually called robust optimization or max mean or, or min max kind of solutions. So it also have some pros, okay? So pros is to any distribution, okay? We just uh, you know consider the worst case, okay? Only support of the parameter are needed to be known. But many people know the bad things is just too conservative. And also it ignores the observed or training data information and what kind of a statistic we can draw from those data. Okay. And also this can be out in practice uh, since they are too conservative, 
they usually result in a decision which is do nothing. So in this case, and the robust probably are too, too conservative. Okay. So uh, here, uh, uh, we motivation for a middle ground. So in practice, we usually don't know exact distribution, but some uh, samples, we do have samples, we do have a training data. We can summarize some kind of uh, descriptive statistical information. So we should know the information should not be wasted. Okay? And uh, so that's why we how to choose an intermediate approach between just a pure average, sample average, or, uh, or completely robust. Can we find some kind of a middle ground? Okay? So in this particular case, uh, which we proposed, of course, it also have non history, uh, which we called distribution robustic optimization or learning. Okay. So what we do is, on the outside, we still maximize X in some constraint set, but we still adopt this kind of average or expected objective value. But however, we choose a distribution which is in certain distribution set, okay, which is called the D. So because we don't know true distribution, maybe we can design a D, which is many, many different distributions, maybe centered at the sample distribution, but can be diverted from the sample distributions. Okay, so that's the idea. We choose this kind of optimization. Okay, so in this case, we basically choose the distribution. So for whatever functions is in the programs, and actually is a, is a, can be a, because this is a, a distribution, this, this expected value taking over distribution, and you can think about a finite distribution, that's the probability at each scenario. So this would be a linear functions. So the inner program actually can be written as some kind of a linear programming or convex optimization problems, depending on what's the set you're going to design. Okay. So that, and, and uh, we think, maybe provide a good immediate and uh, approach. Okay. So then the question is how to choose this D. Okay. So we need to consider the following, and that's my game. I think we first has to consider tractable, okay, which is the fast algorithm still available. If the original problem is easy, we want this distribution robust version also easy. So I just mentioned it because this is a linear optical optimization. So that can be done very fast. We also want to construct this set D, which have some practical or statistical meaning, okay, which can fully utilize or observed on the training data. It's not naively use them, but use them more intelligent. Then we also have to consider performance. We want this to be uh, uh, really works in practice or for some benchmark cases. So this is uh, and, uh, motivation, okay. There was a rich history on DRO. You can trace the very back, although at the time people does not code and distribution robust. I think one of my students, Dina and I, in 2007, his PhD thesis, and also in the OR, we formally called this is called the distribution is robust. And since then, it used in many, many uh, scenarios. And uh, especially recently, used some kind of data analysis and then also machine learning. Okay. So I'm not going to go through details. I just want to uh, talk about several ways to construct this distribution uncertainty set, which is the D. So first, uh, I think I come out, which is called a moment, okay? Because the very, very simple descriptive statistically, which once we have a data, we can construct the, the sample mean, we can even construct the sample covariance, okay? Then for the true distribution, of course, the probability distribution has to be integral to equal to one, has to be non-active. We also want this distribution create a mean value, which is also centered at a sample mean. So we have a constructed lambda one. So now gamma one controls the set. 
We also want this and the distribution generate a, a variance, which is bounded by the sample variance by some constant gamma two. Okay, so this is the one way to do it. Is we call the moment constraints on distribution. Okay, so in this case, we can uh, the, to answer the first question. We can prove on the mild technical assumption the DRO model can be solved and any bit precisions which is the polynomial in log one over epsilon and the size of the X and also psi. So this is a paper which you said that answered the tractability, okay? That's then the second question, does it also give ideal statistic, okay, sense? Then the second theorem says, if you choose gamma one properly, which in this rate and the lambda two, gamma two in this kind of a rate, then you can uh, certainly show, and with this probability, you can show the true distribution, if it exists, must in this D set. So, so this set does contain the two dis true distribution if there was a, a ground truth distribution. Okay. So this is uh, how uh, we answer the question. Uh, for third question, performance, and the paper also talk about the applications and especially in the financial market. So then I'm not going to talk in more details here today. Okay. So this is one way uh, to use moment information. And there was another way to construct a uh, bound this possible distribution is use the likelihood uh, functions. Okay. So typically, in practice, we observed many, many different size, okay? Then we can use a psi to construct a likelihood function. Instead of maximize it, we just uh, provide a lower bound gamma. So we give some room for other distribution still above this uh, the threshold, okay? Not just uh, choose the maximum. If you max it, that's just the sample distribution. So we reduce gamma a little bit, if need be the room, so we allow other distribution can be possibly included, or maybe those solution are true distributions. Okay. So this is one way, of course, for many people, and you already know, if you have observed the data, you can create the sample uh, probability, then your true probability here, and just consider very simple, discrete, finite case. And you can construct the likelihood or entropy functions. Uh, this is all concave functions. Concave function has to be greater than something. So that gives distribution again is the convex set. Okay. So this could be just simply likelihood, or could it be just the entropy type and the functions. So uh, the paper and uh, in the one Peter Green and they proved uh, this also give a lot of a good statistical and uh, theory uh, come to obey some statistical theories. Okay, for example, divergence theories, Bayesian statistic, uh, non-parameter empirical likelihood theory by Owen and my colleague, and also some particle theory and uh, any any other things. Okay, so again. So this D construction also give problem can be solved easily as a convex organization, but also uh, connect to very nice statistical theory or probability theory. Uh, another one, the most popular one, and it's called the Wasserstein ambiguity set. Okay, so basically we consider the distance between two distribution. So we have sample distribution, and then we have to consider all the distribution around this sample distribution. So how to measure the difference between two distribution, we use this kind of uh, Wasserstein distance, which is itself is the semi-infinite transportation uh, linear programming programs. So in this case, we basically say probability measure equal to one, and the true distribution, uh, the distribution we consider, including in our D, it's not too much from the sample distribution and less than some distance, which is give some room for other watches then. And the distribution can be exist as long as it's close to the sample distribution. Okay. So again, you can prove, again, this is a convex set because this is a, a linear programming problems. Okay. 
objective is convex, okay, less than something, give a convex set. The program is tractable and also have many, many nice and uh, theoretical guarantee. So more recently, this paper are uh, in 15, 17, they publish in MIPS and also mechanics and other things published in 16, some become a best paper in MIPS. So that's why. Uh, so, uh, for example, I just say to show your tractability, for example, if your objective function is some kind of a logistic regression functions, okay, then you can prove the DRO after you consider the robust version, use Vashistan, and the program is just the original sample average optimization plus a regularity functions, okay. So, uh, this is also very, very rich. That means I know in many, many uh, learning or regression problem, people do add uh, some type of uh, regressions. Uh, at the time, maybe people just uh, think they may be for tractable or stability of the solutions. But now we can see and uh, this regularized objective into original loss function actually played a role to make a solution more robust, okay? So that gives you another mathematical foundation why regularized regression and uh, need to be considered, okay? Not just the simple samples. So this is a 215 papers. And that also tells you the problem is not much hard to the original problems. All you need to do is just to add some convex regularization with appropriate norm. So this is a picture by a colleague uh, produced in 2017. For example, you have original eight number eight, then you just uh, pollute them or distort them by another number called three, okay? So, and then after you add those three numbers in from data into number eight, then this eight, number eight become fuzzy, fuzzy. And when you add those perturbation big enough from number three, the final number does look like a three. So this is a different AI identifier. The last one is called the Washington and the robust identifier, okay, estimator. So you can see uh, this is the number at that time, the ERM already uh, identified label this as a number three. FGM at this stage still identify as number three. After that, become eight, okay? Then this is uh, up distortion at this level. This become, oh, this number is not eight, it's three. So this, uh, then you can see Vasha stands identify as immune from this perturbation or noise attack until at a very, very later stage, uh, or the distortion is big enough, then Vashastan started to identify this number as number three. So that just to give you a little bit of visualization how this robust identifier can be a little bit better against the portable attack or perturbations. Uh, here at Stanford, I also have a standard student used to them uh, to do uh, like uh, imagery and uh, for reconstruction and also identification for possible disease and uh, at the hospitals. So here you can see the distortion we restored used to robust version does look like uh, uh, more like the two, two pictures. So we have uh, two pictures, we add a noise and until uh, then we reconstruct it. And uh, this is one use the distribution robust to construct it, which does give you a little bit better pictures. So other ways, just the several different popular approach without, a, without any robustness consideration. But the last one is use dictionary learning based and the plus and the DRO with distribution robust. I also like to uh, talk about uh, most recently and uh, we started the distribution robust non-parametric conditional estimation. So uh, we basically say people familiar with conditional probability, we want a conditional, and we want to give estimation given the covariate x equal to something, okay? 
So conditional estimation instead of general um, estimation, because in practice, we do have some knowledge, we do have some evidence, certain scenarios happened. Then under these scenarios, then what's the estimation? Instead, produce a general estimation. Of course, we can solve, uh, you know, completely mapping, finding an X map to Y, we observe the Y, we find an X, we already know X, the pairs, we find complete the construction over all the domain X. Then you have to solve an infinite kind of optimization problems. And a simple way probably just say, we have some loss functions, we want to find a beta, we minimize beta, and uh, on the x given x naught, which is the one realized in the scenarios, okay? Then we just need to solve this on the local optimization problems. Of course, uh, you can see for this local optimization, and at x equal to x naught, we may not have too many samples, too many training data. So a popular approach is people use the label hood, okay? So instead including the data exactly x equal to x naught, we include some uh, other data, which is close to x naught, okay? And then once we include the labeling data, then a lot of uncertainty occurs. So that introduces us, we need to use more robust because the distribution uh, can be mixed up, especially for non-homogeneous data, okay? So in this particular case, uh, that indicate we need a more robustness when we use what kind of, instead of use, just to use a sample distribution, we maybe need to use robust distribution. So that's the paper, uh, which is the, um, recently wrote. So we apply to this to means the data. So this is the method we use KNN, which is the nearest, K nearest neighbor, okay? Uh, Gauss uh, kernels method, some another method with called NE method. So we just compare, apply to this minced data. So I could do 100 experiment by training data, uh, selectively select 50, 100, 500, then we test for out sample errors. So this is a KNN. So so here reported the number is called the confidence okay, interval. What, what kind of one, one? So this is the out sample accuracy when running estimate and that this is the 90% confidence to estimate, okay? So in this case, we do uh, the, the confidence intervals and the confidence level. Uh, here's the number, which is say, you here we have a 34% to be more comfortable than some other method. For this one, we have a 47 more and, and conf more confident, okay? So basically say this kind of a robust version, which increase the confidence level of your estimator, okay? So this is a distribution robust local estimate. So this is ongoing research, but we're still are doing more on the studies, okay? We, we think uh, at the risk of uncertain world, and the conditional estimation can be very useful. So this is uh, uh, what the, what we talk about. So uh, so basically, it's a quick summary: the old year the situation, guaranteed confidence levels, okay, uh, and also uh, tractable, and uh, sometimes maintain the saving computational complexity, and also. Uh, can be applied to very, very range of learning, estimation, and decision-making problems. Okay. Now I'm going to switch to the second topic, which is called online linear optimization. Okay. So I'm going to motivate this uh, topic by a very simple example. Suppose you want to sell a stock of goods or products. Okay. So there was a selling number of buyers fixed, there were fixed inventory of goods and the customer come and require a bundle of goods and a bid for certain prices. So they just uh, and, uh, buy something, okay? Then your decision is sell or not to sell to individual customers. Of course, you still want to make a decision for each bid. You want to maximize your revenue. So here's the pictures. Suppose you have this quantity available for sales at uh, online stores. 
So the bitter come out, okay? So this is, he said, $100, you want to buy one pen, okay? One pair of shoes and one hat, okay? So he want to pay $100. Another guy come out, bid for one, one t-shirt, buy a one hat, he's willing to pay $30, okay? So the question is, given available industry, given these bids, now the decision is, should I sell to this guy or should I sell to this guy? or which one has to be sell, okay? So in this particular case, X1, we can say is a zero or one. X2 is zero or one. Zero means not sell, and one means to sell, okay? So, of course, in the offline versions, you can formulate a so-called binary linear programming programs. So RT, that's your individual revenue. XT is a zero or one. That's your total revenues. That's the how much you bid for that resource or not. This number is either zero or one. You give XT is a little one. So this on the left hand side, that's the total required resources or inventory. Then should it be less or equalable, the available resources at the very beginning. So that's the offline. So it's the binary again. We can solve them. But now we consider this as an online or streamlined version. Okay, so we observe RT AIT at a time t, or the index, but without knowing the future information. But we still have to decide XT equal to zero or one. Okay, so in this setting, we only need to know available inventory and the total number of customers. I'm going to relax that a little bit later. So the question is sequentially revealed, then we have to make irrevocable decisions, okay? So either XT is a zero or one. So this is called the online versions, okay? So we can make some technical assumptions, and uh, the only thing we'll make uh, statistically is not this IID, but however, AT, IT is already exist, but they arrive in a random order. So instead, uh, T could one come first, but could it be someone else come first, okay? So uh, this is only, so that means our revenue, any online decision would be dependent on what the order is realized. So that will become a random numbers. So here's the, what we do is, we basically say for any, any online arguments, okay? So first we design the offline maximum value. That would be upper bound for online optimal value. Then we call any online argument is a C competitive if okay, our online arguments collect the revenues over all the possible permutations, average up, great equal to C times these offline values for all the possible data, A and the pi. Okay, so we not assume A pi. Okay, and uh, and uh, and that's it. actually we need this for all the a pi. Okay, in what follows, I'm going to let b to be minimum inventory. So if you take a look, this basically say take a minimum. So everything is homogeneous. So what's the smallest one? Smallest one is the fifty. So that's called our capital B. Okay, so here's the theorems for any fixed epsilon greater than zero minus one. There was no online argument, so solve online linear programming with competitive ratio one minus epsilon. If B at the smallest level inventory is less than log M divided by epsilon squared. M is the number of inventory, different resources. Okay. Then we have another theorem, say, however, if B is big enough, you do have an epsilon, okay, one minus epsilon competitive online arguments, okay? So the second theorem, this theorem is proved by construct the counter examples, and then this just the design arguments. So if now we want the epsilon to be small as possible, so in that case, you need more and more inventories. So that means you put something on sales, you make better, and make sure the inventory have a plenty. Because online sale, you may make the mistake at the beginning, but if your inventory is big enough, you can still make up a back and the end right? because you can you can afford many those kind of things. Okay. However, 
if your B is too small, you don't want to put this online for sales, especially you don't have any training data. You start from scratch. Okay. So this is a paper, which is the, also 2010. So what's the major uh, idea of this? It's basically construct the itemized price. Okay. So suppose you have some kind of itemized price for each of these goods. Okay. Then the online decision would be easy. For example, this guy bid for hundred dollars. He bought him by three things. These three things, 45, 45, or 15, that total uh, to me, the seller and I, to say is cost one or five dollars. He only bid the 100, of course. X1 should be equal to zero, no sales. So for the second one, you want to buy two items, add up, it's only $25, 10 plus 15, but if he bid $20, $30, then I'm sales, okay? So the question is, does this kind of price exist? If it exists, can be learned. So the core question is, it turns out the price still exists, okay? And actually becomes the shuttle price of the offline linear programming problems. Then the second question is, can you learn without know all the information, all the data at the very beginning, okay? So this is a code, uh, okay? And then this become a pricing learning sense. So how to learn? Of course, it's like a sample. So we create the one-time learning algorithms, okay? Maybe learn the price, use that price, as the price to make that decision as what I described before, okay? Then we can also add dynamic learnings, okay? So this is, uh, uh, to, then the question is dynamic learning, does that improve one-time learnings? Okay. So I'm quickly uh, go through what's the one-time learning. One-time learning is basically say, at a very, let's say epsilon is 0.01, okay? So 1%. So at the first 1% bids okay, or customers, I'm not doing anything. I'm just uh, wait until first comer, until 1% customer comes. I put this review the data as a small scale sample linear program. Then I give them 1% resources, okay? So I need use one recent process, solve 1% of sample problems. Then I find what's the shuttle price, and I'm going to use these due prices, which I usually call the shadow price, which is the price for these constraints, then to make a decisions, okay? So what I can say, how good is this uh, epsilon uh, and sample prices? That's not good enough. Then you can see for any fixed epsilon, the one-time learning algorithm is one minus epsilon competitive. If B is greater than these numbers, which is same as before, but however, divided by epsilon three to the power three. So that means this B has to be one magnitude, one of the epsilon bigger than the theorems, which is the, what I described, not the possibility theorems. So here, earlier I presented two results. One is impossible, another is possible. But this result even need more stronger conditions. Another thing is the dynamic learning. So, why we only learn one time? Because when we have epsilon n data revealed, then wait until two epsilon data revealed, the bits, okay, come customer comments. At this juncture, I can recompute the price, use two epsilon data points, correct? Okay, so actually I can consider, continue to do that. So then we have a price update and the schemas, okay? So here we put some kind of, you know, adjustment just for mathematical proof. Then they basically say, we'll update the price at this two power two pace, okay? One time, wait until longer, wait even longer, wait a long, we just update this price. Because as more and more data collected, our learning, our shadow price should be more and more accurate, okay? So in this case, we do have these theorems, so now, Instead, so we now we can develop a theorem uh, for dynamic learning. We only need this is the epsilon instead of cubic, and we only need the epsilon to the square. So that's our possible theorem proved early. It's basically by this dynamic learning algorithms. Okay. So, so in this case, 
how many LP we need to solve? One over epsilon. But there was later on, the whistle paper says, why you only wait too long to resolve LP to update the price? You can update the price at any time period, whenever a bit is revealed. Yes, if you learn often, then you, you do have a better payoff. So you have achieved slightly bad competitive ratios. Uh, the cost is you have to solve them very frequently, okay? Uh, there was a number in HL, we just did, so don't put too much attention. I don't want to get more details here, but I just say. Well, the question is, from the theoretical academic point of view, we compute this kind of uh, update price. Does this price converges, okay, under these permutation models, okay? Uh, can the model handle double market? What I mean double market means, and some people come out for sale for the buy, maybe some people can come for sales. So in that case, some of those coefficients can be lactic. Okay. So we always so it's, it's like you sell some, some resource, but some people it's like you sell the books. Some people buy book, some people sell the used book. You can collect back, whatever. Then the question is use what price? to buy back those books, okay, or resources. So right now, uh, we don't know what happened. And also, could we have online algorithm avoid solving LPs, uh, linear programs? Linear programs, or those polynomial time solvable, become a very, very efficient solver exist. However, a solve a very, very big LP, still very, very time consuming. So. For this case, if you want to online to sell something, to allocate something, you want to do it in the milliseconds. You cannot afford to solve LP to find what's the right price to do it, okay? So this is something, I'm just put at some recent result. So what's the recent result? First, I'm talking about, take a look at what's the due of this online, offline uh, due problems. It's basically finding the price. B is the inventory, and the Y is the snack, which is the AIP, that's not RG, that's the, you know. So if you observe this intermediate decision, YI, so then you basically say, your due problem is minimize BI times B, the P, that's the, that's the price, plus all these terms up to N of them. So this is just the RG minus the, not the difference between the bid price and the aggregated cost and take a positive number. Positive number which means if it's negative number, use zero, otherwise use what is the number is up. So this is called uh, what in, in AI people call the U, something like that, okay? So uh, yeah, so this is the a linear problem. This is a, a dual problem. So first we have M term is the fixed, A is like, uh, you know, points. So you can rewrite this, you can average this, become uh, divided by n. So basically, because here we assume the bi, okay? So you take, normalize them, okay? Then you can view this is the sum kind of a sample average. So then you can rewrite as a stochastic optimization. If you consider this can go to infinity, okay? So actually, so fmp, actually can be viewed as the sample approaching of these expected objective values, okay? So uh, you only, ha only have n observed and the data points, okay? Well, the questions, of course, and if you assume some kind of IID, like a pi and a come from sample distribution, from some distribution, then uh, of course, this sample average should converge to FP, but the questions at what rate, okay? So in this case, we have some theorems, okay, and this is stochastic assumption, basically uh, the pi and the a comes at the IID, okay, then you do have some kind of a concentration theorems, okay, I'm not going to details. Uh, nice thing about these theorems, this a, so the number a in the original program, if people just buy, all this number is just a zero and a one, but if you have a people for sale, this number can be an active. So this theorem, this theorem actually works 
and also for double market, which means A can be negative and the bar can be negative. Okay. So then, uh, so I'm going to, uh, now we talk about what's the performance metrics. So under this kind of a stochastic optimization, a very good one is called the regret. Okay. So you have offline optimal solutions. Okay. Then you generate, use your online algorithms, you generate online solutions. So this is the offline revenue for this N sample problems. This is the online, of course, and uh, we have to, you know, and make online and it could be RN may not be optimal because we have to make a decision online. So in this case, one magic is the magic. What's the, what's the case, the absolute difference between the offline ones and the online ones. Okay, here we consider IID. Uh, second ones, we also consider data is already exist, it's non-homogeneous, but they come as a rundown orders or called a rundown permutation. So in this case, the offline is the fixed, okay, it does not depend on, that's the pure deterministic offline values. Again, minus online, uh, this expected value is come from the uh, 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 rundown permutations. But here we also consider what's the constraint of violations. You remember in the original problem, AX has to be less equal to V. So we have to consider under what kind of a violation if we do online distribution. So we consider this called the by objective performance measures. Uh, this is a workable in practice because usually these constraints is not like a soft, it's, it's soft in practice. So it's constrained that you can violate it a little bit by replenishment of those kind of things. Okay. So here's, uh, we also talk about action dependent learning uh, due to the time. And I'm going to skip this one. So I basically say in this particular case, you can prove some regret. For example, some original algorithms, okay. Uh, you can prove the regret is the level square root of n, some in the log n, some in the square root of n. So this is called the action dependent algorithms. You can actually prove this has a log n regret. Typically in these problems, the revenue is like O n. So when your absolute value is log n, so log n divided by n, so that goes to zero very quickly. Even you have a square root of n, total revenue is the in the order of n, again, square root of n divided by n also go to zero very quickly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yes. Uh, so then, so this is uh, what I did. But however, I wanted to answer the second question. So what's the second question? How to develop LP-free algorithms? So what's the LP free argument? Just to echo what I just told, because uh, the time is you make an online decision. You cannot just afford to solve LP for a few hours, especially it's a problem. Even LP is solvable in polynomial time, but uh, uh, you know, and then once we have in uh, tens thousand variables, you still need to fill you still, and then maybe half minutes to solve it. So the question is, can we do faster? Okay. Here is this called the LP free algorithms. So what's the LP free algorithms? And instead, it's uh, so basically say, if you remember, I posted this as a some kind of a sample average optimization. And then can we just use the gradient method or sub gradient method because this is non smooth function to solve these problems. While at the same time, I update the price but also make the decisions. So this is what I talk about, okay? Right now, there was a very recent paper, we say, oh, we, we let B divided by N. So this is B is the total resource divided N. So this is the average resource and the used by each customer. I designed the price at the very beginning equal to zero. So at the very beginning, I just say, what's the bid? Given the price, if this reward is bigger than the cost, I give them equal to one, otherwise give them to zero. Then after I compute this, then I update this at uh, the price. I use PT plus the gradient of the price. Okay, 
then plus some gamma t, which is can be so as a step size. Then once the price, I just take a union of zero and uh, a cap of zero, because if it's the price is negative, then I just uh, set them equal to zero. Then uh, I just update this. At the same time, I already make a decision, but also price at this very update. So what's the computational complexity? It's just to scan through the data, okay? So whenever you have a data, you just compute a simple gradient and update gamma t, okay? And this is called, you can view because we assume random permutations. So you can think about this as a and a designed stochastic subgradient method for solve that two problems. Okay. What can you prove? So this is the recent paper of a couple of our Stanford students. As now, as you take step size, you could one over square root n, then the expected version, this is for stochastic. So we assume IID. And then the regret is m squared to the n, and the constraint of violation is also m squared to the n. Again, the total inventory is about in the order of n. So this violation is absolute value term. If they divide by n, as n substantially bigger than m, so the relative violation would be very, very small. Okay. So we also worked for permutation. Okay, to me. If you can prove for, for random permutation for non homogeneous data, all you need to do is the data comes in at a random order. I think that this is more, more harder, more difficult to prove than the IID. If you have IID, basically, it's everything you already have a concentration, basically, and that data all looks like similar. So it's, that's easy to prove. But however, if you do have non homogeneous data, okay, and uh, you just need to mix them up. Then this is what we can prove. We can prove the regret, so m log n squared root n, okay? Then this is the m squared root n. So basically in the regret permutation versus the IID, we just the log n squared root n. As I said, the revenue is all the all n. So this is a very, very small number relatively as n goes to big, okay? so. Uh, so it, again, this is, uh, and uh, so we also proved some early algorithms. It's just basically on solve LPs. You already heard me. Each time they have to solve entire LP problems, okay? But ours just to update the gradient. But even for those solve LP algorithms, they, you can prove it's not better competitive uh, regret. This is square root M, basically, compared to LP-based algorithm and these fast algorithms, you lost the factor square root of M. So once you have a, a M not too big, then that's the uh, way to do it, okay? So online would it be, this fast algorithm can do the job. So here we solved some kind of multi lapsack problems, the benchmark problems. Uh, you, you know, this is a binary integer linear program problems. You can use Globi, take uh, 0.26 seconds. Our fast algorithm is only three, of course. And uh, this algorithm is 100% optimal, only uh, 94, and here 95, then you have a 95. So uh, this, so what the message here is, even about uh, this is online algorithms, okay? You use other algorithm, LP-based, they take many, many long time. So what's the message? Message it says, and uh, this is uh, online algorithms, binary integer programming, you can still get a good guarantee, but much, much faster time. So we also solved the big problems, and uh, M is to 100, goes to 1,000, uh, even uh, the Globi with the best linear programming solver or integer linear program solver. They take uh, 267 seconds, 760, we only take 1.47 seconds. And this time it's not solve the binary LP, actually just to solve a single LP. Okay, the solution come out from here. In this solution time, it's just a linear programming relaxation program. If we really want to solve to 100% optimal for binary integer LP, uh, this time goes to hours and hours. So this is a, a fast argument. And if you don't want to require too much accuracy. 
So here I'm just give a quick summary. Okay. Uh, so the algorithms distribution free. Okay. Uh, better to dynamic learning. Learning also while doing the decisions, multi-item pricing, and also more general online optimization. And uh, actually, and uh, another interesting is, uh, can we approximately solve large scale offline variety with proposed fast algorithms? Okay, even we have data, maybe we don't want to solve those problems with all the data included in the in, in one time. Maybe we can solve it in this kind of a randomly permuted fashion. We just take the data one at a time and solve them, just scan the data with that fast algorithms. We can still get a good solution even for the original offline binary LPs. So even data available, we may be desirable to solve the problem in online fashions. Okay. So uh, finally, I only maybe have five minutes because I start a little bit later. So I'm talking about uh, the economic theories. Okay. So as I said, one of the uh, data scientists. You, you just cannot just focus on data, but also you need to consider human behaviors. Okay, so what's the situation? Consider a beach. So the solution is if we open, it's going to be crowded, and if we close, nobody use it. Okay, so uh, public goods has no value to anyone. Okay, so the question is: in such a pandemic situation, we basically even public spaces like gyms, schools, shops, and the parks, beaches, you need to maintain certain capacity. But in the normal case, there was no capacity constraints. Okay, everybody can crowd it as much as possible. So how to allocate those kind of things to utilize public goods? Okay, so uh, the one popular used scenario is divide this enjoy time into time of use. Okay. Maybe we can have a morning session, we have a long to afternoon session, then we have a long afternoon to evening sessions. Okay, so in this particular case, we can divide this public space in the time you use periods, then people can book or purchase those permits to use those public spaces in a much, much better organized way. So this is an online project with one of my students, a professor at Stanford, so we start to think about these problems. Okay. So the question is, okay, we have strict capacities, okay? Uh, good alternatives, time of use, how should we locate? And can we develop some kind of idea use market? Then how to book, how to how to schedule those uh, people, which one can use the beach at which time? So then we said maybe market is a good way. We can use artificial currencies. So people can be each household, their cell phone can be injected several coupons. Okay. Then people use those coupon or artificial currency to purchase or book those time of use. Okay. So we can start to create schedules. Okay. We can price them and uh, we can transfer the coupons. Okay. Use uh, and buy those time slots. Okay. Once they buy, they have a uh, uh, permit, then the cell phone can show to the rangers they have a permit so it can stay in the park. Okay, we can now we have the postman over there. So the question is how to set up the prices for each time period, okay, such that the resource can be efficiently allocated while also keep into each individual satisfied. So that become uh, economic behavior utility theories. Okay, and uh, so this is called the Fisher's models. Okay, so people have some kind of utility value to buy goods. Okay, so buyers I, goods is J. So how much you buy X I J? Okay, you have ice play ice buyer have each individual utility. So basically, constraint is what you purchased uh, money should it be not more than the budget would give to you. Okay, so the question is, can exist the price? such that people can decentralize to, to buy those goods. At the end, we find the optimal solution for each of these, and also the goods are all sold out. There was no surplus, no leftover. So this is called the market clearing price. So in this scenario, 
all the parts can be fully utilized. The beaches can be fully utilized without violate the capacity constraints. Okay. Well, the famous D theorems is this is the pictures. This is how many goods are available. Uh, so you have n goods. This is the how much available. Okay. Then this is your budget. On the bio side, you have a budget. You have utility values. So can you design the price P1, P2? People can buy those goods on the free market, but once they bought it, the optimal solution optimized each individual under that prices. Okay. So this is the famous theorem, Eisenberg Gale, and uh, they said, oh, all you need to do is just construct a social optimal solutions. So you just aggregate the utility and use WI, that's the budget available for ice buyers. Utility take a look, sum it up, then you just make sure all the goods are used up. Then you can construct the, what's the Lagrangian multiplier. You can prove that Lagrangian multiplier it is the equilibrium price. Okay. So we want to use this. But the question is in our optimization problem now, instead of just the budget constraint, we may also have other physical, physical constraint. For example, when people buy the time of use then at several period, they only buy the one of them, but it can be any one of them. So we may add some constraint, all those purchase add up should be less equal to one. So you don't want to buy all of them, okay? So in that case, we added the physical constraints. Then the question is, is that equilibrium price still exists? Or can it still be solved by these social problems? It turns out this problem has not been studied much before, okay? With this additional physical constraint to each individual's optimization problems. So the question is, can we study it? Then we find a way. Actually, all you need to do to accommodate these possible physical constraints, individual phys uh, physical constraints or accumulative constraints, all you need to do is you can still construct a social problem by adjust the budget, okay, computationally. So when you compute the properly delta i, then you can prove this, it is the price. So you can basically say, oh, the price under certain conditions still exists and also can, can be computed by sequentially solve these problems, okay? So all you need to do is just uh, put some delta i, for example, delta i equal to zero at the first, it works, works, otherwise I just, uh, you know, iterative, okay? So in this particular case, actually come out down very fast, just, uh, you know, less than 50 steps, you get that ideal delta levels and all the physical constraints are satisfied for each individual but also you find that equilibrium price. Okay. So uh, do exist on the mild technical assumptions, seems to be able to solve efficiently from simple iterative procedure. As uh, you know, as I said, it's all you need to do is just to describe, okay? Just iterate, I'm not going to details, okay? About the questions, is the equilibrium price factor unique? Is the simple iterative procedure proof of convergence? So right now we just empirically observe it converges. And also on the more theoretical side, is that also become a fixed point of theorem problems? Is that kind of a task type? And people know you have a different uh, fixed point and uh, uh, type. Uh, task is the one, do you have a polynomial type arguments? So the question is, and if, if the, is this problem is the class PPAD or exists the polynomial time arguments? So, so this is a market, and uh, which is uh, which I think may be useful uh, in such a difficult time. Maybe people to think more about how our data scientists, how our decision makers, okay, can be useful in such a dynamic and also very human nature related environment. So yes, I'm done. Okay, so it's three topics. Uh, let's yeah. thank Professor Ye again for the great talk. So uh, at the peak, there have been over 15,000, uh, 1,500 people online at the, sa at the same time across wow. different platforms. Thank yes. you. On, on Bilibili alone, there are over 1,000 people. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And so 
maybe okay, you have to answer some question. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let me pass you some some of the questions raised in the uh, Q and A section. So the first question uh, is regarding your uh, the first part of your talk, the one on DRO. So yes. When it comes to the most seemingly most complicated one, the uh, Wasserson DRO problem, uh, do we need to, except for the ambiguity set constraint, uh, there may be, uh, are there any other constraints we need to uh, take consideration? Uh, for example, uh, here the X is belong to some set, uh, the, uh, the variable X belong to some set X, and the distribution function uh, seems to also have a constraint where the um, the distributions function itself also has a constraint, say the negative infinity takes a value zero and the infinity takes a value one. Yeah, I, I think yes. Uh, the, the complete model does consider X can be constrained in whatever fashions and uh, this can be characterized by big X, okay? And mm -hmm. also in the D, what I constructed only, for example, uh, here is the moment constraints. You can definitely add some other constraint. For example, some support measure has to be equal to zero at some data points. Yeah, you can add whatever constraint in the D. Uh, I believe as long as this constraint is, uh, is the convex set, the robust, uh, the distribution robust version should be still tractable. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, you can add a constraint, whatever constraint, because as I said, uh, all our problem is going to be a minimization over this D. So probability distribution, so this is a convex objective values, I mean, actually linear objective value. So as long as this D contain whatever uh, realistic uh, uh, or regularity constraint you may add into D, that's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So uh, a further question is, uh, here it seems that in the DRO problem, the objective function is linear in the, is a linear functional of the distribution, F, yes. F cosi. Yes. So the question is, is it possible to extend to other, uh, say, go beyond the linear functional cons and consider a nonlinear function of the distribution, say, the, uh, the variance? Yes, that's a very... So in terms of the distribution, I believe, you know, you, you, you take uh, average values, or you think about a discrete case, a discrete uh, case. This is all probability take uh, uh, times function values, right? It just average them up. So in this case, in the inner problems, the probability is the decisions, okay? Of course, you can add some kind of like, uh, you know, entropy or some other things yeah, as now as the function you add, so you can think about this, the function of probability. So as you may add some kind of a variance, like, a, you know, like, like a portfolio things, you also want to minimize the variance and all those kind of things. Yes, you can add whatever functions by perturbing this function, by add some objective value depending on the probability. As now as those functions are convex functions, Actually, this is still tractable. Now, actually, we, 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 we now also introduce some penalty functions. Uh, to, for example, you want to enforce each probability, each uh, scenario have a positive probability, you can add some log function on probability. So make sure they have a chance uh, uh, happen. Yes, you can, you, can, you, can, uh, you, can, you can add, you can make this function in the problem it's not in a function in probability distribution. Mm -hmm. So an another question regarding the first part is that, uh, is it possible to consider a, a solving an online version of DRO problem? Oh, that's a great question. Yes, I, I think uh, that, should be, that, that should be actually more realistic. So once we collect a sample, it's like, uh, yeah. Uh, so you, we can solve a, a problems on the small samples, but a later on the problems comes in. Actually, uh, I know people already developed like a first order, you know, gradient method to solve these problems. So all you need is finding what's the case distribution, compute the gradient. So when you have more samples coming in, 
you can just update the gradient vectors and solve it. Yes, I think that would be distributed robust online optimization. That would be a great topic for people to work on. I think that also in the real world, you know, think about the COVID-19, all the sample point is day by day comes in, how we can, you know, robust, how should, what number of uh, ventilators should we prepare? You know? We, we can solve the robust version. Yeah, actually this distributing robust optimization can be traced back to inventory control. So basically like news vendor problems. And uh, yeah, no, that's a great actually suggestion as well. Um, okay, and another question is uh, regarding the, the second part. So uh, the question is, um, yeah. uh, in what case we might have uh, those AT and RT coming from different probability distributions? Oh, yes. So in many, many, so to me, on the online problems, many people consider a problem is the IID. So there was many, many scenarios and the people may not come from the same distribution. You can think about uh, people come to buy things then I, I think that you know our our customer may not be homogenized, may not be have the same behaviors. We do have some rich people and the poor people. They when they provide a bid to buy those things, their pattern may be different. They cannot be come from IID. Okay, and also uh, when we put this for sales, people uh, buy from US or people come out a bit from China, may be different. Okay, so uh, this uh, for linear program problems, many, many problems, we don't observe those data which look similar. Actually, they, they look very different, okay? So I, I think that many, many online resource allocation do have, if every, every customer or bidder in this case, if they all look like a similar, Actually, we don't need to spread them to make a decision. We, we just cluster them, you know. This is the same cluster person. Maybe they can treat as one super bios instead of a small bios. You can solve them deterministic. I think uh, for online optimization, the more difficult things, we have to consider this inhomogeneous data. But, but people can come out maybe at a rundown orders. So that's my view. If everything assumed IID, if you proved something for IID, to me, that's not a surprise, okay? And I will have to be able to handle this kind of inhomogeneous or non-homogeneous kind of data, non-IID patterns. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and also for, uh, regarding the second part, uh, I think you mentioned the the subgradient, uh, the dual subgradient ascent algorithm for the uh, yes. for the online uh, linear, uh, for the online li linear programming problem. So, yes. is there any connection between this problem and the mirror descent algorithm? Yeah, you can you can you can you can say this is uh, this is online. Yes. So this particular case, okay. Uh, so actually, it's a dual is the it is the we, we solve the dual we we minimize it. Okay. We formulate the problem into these kind of fashions, but we solve them one at a time. So it's like uh, I draw gradient for the first, for, for j equal to one, then we solve gradient for j equal to two. So since they are randomly permuted, so you can think about this as a uh, 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 gradient, yeah. So you, you can see the algorithm is very, very simple. The algorithm is basically say, we start some arbitrary price, which is equal to zero. We don't have to start equal to zero. So all we need to do, we still use that price. If you, if this bit is over bit, then I, I sell to them, okay? If this bit is under bit, which my underlying price, then I'm giving them to zeros. So I, I think, uh, 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 a mirror descent probably is more offline versions, a little bit more sense. So this is a, a more online. So this is a price, okay? So this is a gradient. So you can think about this is a gradient of a P. When we have one more samples, okay? Then mm -hmm. we just put a step size, update it, 
So in this case, we go to actually we go to, because of minimization, we go to descent direction, the gradient is d minus this. Then we just uh, project back into non-active often. Then we just keep doing this. Yeah, you, you can say they have some flavors. It's called a mirror descent or mirror ascent stuff. Okay, okay, uh, thank you. So uh, the, the other questions are regarding the last part of, the, of your talk. And the, yes. the first one is that, is it possible to apply uh, ADMM here for the last part? You mean, uh, uh, you mean for, for this, how to uh, find yes. the equilibrium prices? Yes. Yeah, you can, I, I, uh, I'm not quite sure about that questions because uh, so the original social problems just use WI if there was no physical constraints for individuals. Now we have to, so the theorem says we have to find what's the right delta I. So this is a, a this also have a rich and the economic interpretations. So in the original facial social problems, so each one have a budget, the WI. So that's the I spires utility value. First, we have to take a look because some people may use different units. So we have to sum it up, weighted by budget, then sum it up, construct a social activity, okay? Because we have to use log term over here. So WI here is the weight. So that means people have a large uh, weight they object, their utility value have more weight in this aggregated social objective value functions, okay? So this is one we don't consider any other feasible constraints. But however, once we have physical constraints, we cannot simply use WI over here. We have to adjust to accommodate possible complexity come from these individual feasible constraints, okay? So it's, it's like uh, the bias is not a completely freehand, only depend on the price. They also depend on which day is available, which day is not available, okay? And uh, not feasible constraints. So in this case, we have to choose Delta I. I did not talk about how to choose Delta I. So what a theorem we can prove is, there exists some idea, delta i. Once we use that delta as the input, then when you solve these social problems, then you come out with these ones, then you will be equilibrium price. So this is a one-one correspondence equilibrium theorem. But this theorem does not tell you how to choose delta i. So that still can be an iterative procedure. So that iterative procedure become a fixed point. It's not a convex optimization anymore. So I'm not sure if ADMM is available. So what we used over here is like a best response. So we want this quantity to be equal. So of course this may not be equal. So we put some delta I, then after we solve this problem for that given delta, we come over to Y, if this is equal, we are done. If it's not equal, we just uh, readjust the delta equal to the last of this quantity, put them back, okay? It's more like an iterative fixed point and the iterative process. Uh, actually, uh, we find some examples, the price may not be unique, and also they're isolated. So, that, so the problem itself is not going to be a convex optimization problem. Uh, if it's not convex, and uh, I'm not quite sure how to guarantee convergence using ADMM. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, thank you very much. So the, uh, maybe we have a, our last question. So the last question is about uh, whether it's, it is possible to incorporate a heterogeneity of each participant in the market for the last problem. Yes. Yes. I think I think uh, this is a great question. Yeah, I uh, I think uh, yeah. Uh, we we what what we think about these problems? Actually, we have some students actually working with local government how to schedule in this open park, open beach, and the people maybe can 
by permits uh, electronically use their cell phones. So in that case, we do consider in-home, yeah, heterogeneous kind of a case. Of course, we, we, when we consider these individual problems, we're not consider a person um, uh, at individual levels. We cannot, yeah, actually, well, what we propose is just to observe data. Can we cluster bios? Some bios looks like very similar, okay? We maybe just consider them as a one bios, okay? Then we, all we need to do is compute what's the reasonable price. So in that clusters, some people working on Sunday, some people working on the evening, because this is going to be a new norm. Maybe this has to be, this capacity may be maintained. Even when we reopen re economy, people return to work. We still have very, very inhomogeneous uh, customers, and uh, which is mm -hmm. so. We, we, but but we can certainly cluster them, and uh, and uh, solve them at, at this cluster level instead of individual levels. Yeah. So maybe that's what I mean. Talked to the maybe heterogeneous and uh, and uh, uh, bios stuff. Yeah, that maybe we can do some kind of a data mining or those kind of things, how to divide people and, uh, you know, at different features and then treat them as a super bios. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. So I think maybe let's uh, stop here. And okay. thank you again for, for the very, one, very great talk. Oh, and thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. Everybody stay safe. Okay. Yeah. And also okay. thanks everyone for, for joining. Uh, we are looking forward to seeing you uh, next week. So yeah. thank you. Yes. Thank you. Hope to see thank you, you. So, after. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Okay. Good. See you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.